This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode 21 for February 19th, 2009. I'm Vincent Racaniello. I'm Dick Depernier. I'm Alan Dove. And Max Gottesman. Max Gottesman has joined us today. Max is a professore here at Columbia University in uh, New York, which is where we are, except for Alan, who is somewhere. He's in cyberspace. Somewhere, somewhere in the wilds of Massachusetts, yes. <laughs> and Max is our expert on bacteriophages or phages. Either one. Either will do. Right. right I will say phages. What does phage mean, Max? To eat. To eat. Mangiare. To mangiare. Manger. Any other languages? Essen. Is that German? Yeah. Okay. So we will talk about phages. A number of people have asked for a phage episode. Hmm. So Max is serving up that need. But first, we have a couple of stories, some interesting ones. You know, every week, there is no shortage of stories about viruses. This is all true. And the first one uh, is going to be the wasp virus symbiosis. Would you like to do that, Alan? Sure. Um, so this is a very interesting story that came out um, in science last week. As biologists in the audience are probably aware, um, a lot of species of wasps has a, have a uh, parasitic life cycle where they, um, uh, they find a susceptible caterpillar, lay their eggs in it, and then the eggs uh, hatch out, paralyze the caterpillar, and then eat it from the inside. Um, so the wasp larvae actually, uh, very much like the movie Alien, um, <laughs> they they devour their way out from the, the caterpillar. So this obviously requires a fair amount of, uh, of warfare on the part of the, of the wasp at the molecular level because it has to have the, uh, uh, the ability to, first of all, find the caterpillar and then actually inject its eggs into it. When the eggs are in there, they have to avoid being digested by, by the caterpillar. They have to um, somehow produce some kind of toxin that will allow them to paralyze the caterpillar so that it doesn't go on with its development. Um, and then they have to chew their way out, which is just a, a lovely image. And these uh, <laughs> these wasps are, are very important ecologically. They're actually um, some of the main biological you know, controls that exist for um, a lot of plant pests that would otherwise be devouring our farms. So it turns out this uh, very interesting paper, mostly from Switzerland and France, I guess. Yeah, so they're all Swiss and French. It's uh, Jean-Michel Drezen is the, uh, uh, the senior author on it. And they looked at um, viruses, these polydenoviruses in a certain family of wasps, the Burkonid wasps. So a lot of these species of wasps... Um, inject these uh, particles into the caterpillar, then these, these are virus-like particles that seem to suppress the caterpillar's defenses um, and also seem to shut down its development. And there's been a controversy going back and forth. There's, th these are virus-like particles that contain DNA, but they don't contain a lot of viral proteins that you would expect. They contain wasp genes in the DNA. So there's been this debate, well, the, you know, maybe these are viruses or maybe they're not. Maybe, they're, maybe this is just parallel evolution. The wasp has evolved a virus-like capsid for the toxins that it's delivering. And what this paper demonstrates is that, in fact, these are viruses. Um, and what appears to have happened is that at some point, ancestrally, the wasps co-opted these viruses as symbionts and have enlisted them in order to carry out this parasitic life cycle. So we have a parasitic wasp using a virus, which is, of course, itself a parasite, as a tool to further its parasitic lifestyle, um, which I think is a very, very clever evolutionary mechanism. These viruses are completely defective. They just, yeah. uh, just delivered to the caterpillar enough to suppress, as you said. It's a true symbiosis in the sense that the, the virus has now lost the ability to be a free functioning virus. Um, the wasp can't carry out its life cycle without this modified virus, so they're both now completely dependent right. on each other. The cool thing is that the captured proteins are encoded in genes that are integrated in the wasp genome. Right. And these are expressed only in the ovaries so that when this virus is produced... It's encapsulated in the ovary, and then it's injected into the caterpillar along with the eggs. So, yeah, it's a perfect symbiosis, but it's between the virus and, and its host. It's very amazing. And these are very old viruses. 
Yeah, so this is probably some, you know, some abortive infection that occurred millions of years ago in some ancestral wasp, and uh, the virus managed to get some genes integrated, but the wasp, you know, then co-opted it, and, and this is the result. I have to add a story here because uh, I'm coming to you as a non-virologist. Everybody out there knows that. Max <laughs> obviously knows that too, but I have to add to this story the most remarkable biological association I've ever run across with regards to evolution. I'm not kidding. It was on the cover of The American Scientist, but it might have been missed by a lot of your, our listeners, so I will just describe it very briefly. Manduca sexta is a, uh, a caterpillar that develops into a moth. Its primary food is the tobacco plant, so it's called the tobacco hornworm. It's right. a pest. The story is that as, as Manduca sexta begins to eat the tobacco plant, the tobacco plant becomes injured. It then is stimulated to secrete pheromones, pheromones that are similar to the parasitic wasp's yes. mating pheromone. The <laughs> parasitic wasp is called in by the injured plant and spies <laughs> this caterpillar eating away on the, on the tobacco plant and then infects the caterpillar with these virus-laden larvae. It's a remarkable story because the plant has no need for insect pheromones whatsoever except under these circumstances. So how do these relationships ever develop is beyond everybody's imagination. It's, it's the intricacies of life that actually stun us. And I'm sure Max is going to regale us with stories that at that level, only now the host is quite small, but the parasites are even smaller yet. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> right, and plants plants have been manipulating insects for yes. for quite a while. I mean, no you know, the whole flowering plants have, have recruited bees to act as their, uh, sure. as their reproductive organs. Or they produce juvenile hormone-like uh, uh, substances which prevent the insects from developing further. Lots of right. interesting tricks, no question about it. I, what I find interesting is that there are there are many examples of defective viruses that don't encode capsid proteins, but they're usually supplied by another virus. So, for right. example, you mean like helper viruses. Yes, there are satellites of plants which oh. don't have capsid genes, and they're supplied by other viruses. And there are there is hepatitis delta virus, which encodes just one protein, delta antigen, and nothing else, and it has to be packaged by hepatitis B virus. So it, it can only be packaged in cells co-infected with hep B. And there are other examples, but here it's the host supplying the, it's the capsid. It's, it's remarkable, remar isn't it? Remarkable, yeah. So that's a great story. And there, Absolutely. This past week there have been many uh, pictures of this um, wasp on the internet injecting various caterpillars, very nice colorful pictures. So nice, nice. I'll put a link in to that. That was a very nice story. In closing, we should say that it is really good that somewhere in the world you can do this kind of research. Yes. Maybe it could not be done in this country. Maybe it wouldn't be NIH fundable. NSF. It'd NSF, NSF maybe. NSF fundable, yeah. yeah. Well, they're suffering so much as it is. I'm not sure they could do it right. They don't have a lot of money. Wasp virus symbiosis. Next story, relative humidity and influenza transmission. A paper from Palazzi's group came out using a guinea pig model of flu transmission, which was used to try and address this question of why is flu seasonal? In temperate climates, it peaks in winter months. Why? And their finding was that uh, relative humidity was important. At low relative humidity, these guinea pigs would transmit the infection very efficiently. At higher relative humidities, it was poor. And the idea was that the high relative humidities, the particles of flu that you expel when you sneeze and cough, they absorb more water and they fall to the ground. At lower humidity, they dry out and they can go farther, so you get better transmission. And in the winter, it's drier, and maybe this makes it go. But aren't people closer together in the wintertime because they're driven indoors by the cold weather? People have studied this, and it does it does play a role, but it doesn't explain the whole thing. There was a paper that came out this week, basically took Palazzi's data and reanalyzed them. So they didn't do any new experiments. This is a PNAS paper. Right. They said, you know, the link wasn't so great between relative humidity and transmission. There was only a low association. But what they did is they recalculated in terms of absolute humidity. It's a different kind of measurement. And now it correlates beautifully, the transmission wow. and absolute humidity. All right. The theory is the same, that the droplets that carry the virus get bigger and higher absolute humidity and they fall to the ground. So they mentioned something which is very interesting. Um, relative humidity, the, the number that Palazzi used, is certainly low indoors in the winter. But in the winter, it's high outdoors. 
So it doesn't correlate with the seasonality of flu. But the absolute humidity is in fact cyclical, and it's low indoors and outdoors in the winter. So they say that that supports this idea. Do we know about this effect on droplet size? I mean, it seems intuitive that um, higher relative humidity or higher absolute humidity would affect droplet size. But I mean, are there any atmospheric physics, physicists have, who've commented on this? I don't know. Do you know, Dick? I don't. I don't know the answer. Uh, it's a good question. Well, I, I think, another, it, I I think they speculate. level of question sure, to sure. ask, and that is, this is not a human infection mostly. It's a bird infection. Influenza? So, yeah. So how does this relate to the bird transmission cycle? I'll, I'll tell you, Dick. In birds, it's an intestinal infection. Okay. Migrating aquatic birds, it's an intestinal infection. They drinking. They excrete it in their feces, which is quite liquid. That's 100% aerosol. humidity. It aerosolized, <laughs> and other birds pick it up. Right. So tell me then, should, should we have humidifiers during the winter? Exactly, uh -huh. exactly. That's what they say in nursing homes, which mm -hmm. we are not in. Yet. <laughs> where there's a high risk. <laughs> yet. <laughs> what do you mean we're not in that? When do you pull this place anyway? <laughs> not yet. Yeah, you should have humidifiers. And that would keep the humidity up and the droplets would fall to the ground. Yeah. Absolute humidity is just what it says. It's the amount of water in a fixed volume of air. Relative is what the weatherman tells you. Right. It's a percentage. And here it is, the ratio of the partial pressure of water vapor in a gaseous mixture of air and water to the saturated vapor pressure of water at a given temperature. So it's a ratio. And the weatherman says, today, 30% humidity. That's pretty low. So if you want to remember which one is correlating with flu, it's not the one you hear from the weatherman. Right. All right, the last pre-max story. <laughs> All right, here's another one about mosquitoes, Dick. And Good. The question is, why, when mosquitoes get a virus infection, don't they die? Why are they protected? Good question. In this paper, they used dengue virus infection of Aedes aegypti. The reason the, the mosquitoes survive is when the virus gets in, it triggers an antiviral response in the mosquito, which is an RNA interference response. Wow. It's triggered by the double-stranded RNA that the virus produces when it gets in, and this chops up the viral genome. So it, it doesn't eliminate infection, but it reduces it so the mosquitoes survive and they have virus with them so they can transmit it. Wouldn't do any good for it to kill the mosquito, would it? Not really. So the cool thing is that apparently the virus modulates the response a bit so it can grow at a certain level but not completely. Amazing. It's kind of a balance. I guess the ones that couldn't do that died off. Millions of years Millions ago. Millions of years ago. Yeah, exactly. But the, you know, Chuck. The... Very good, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday again. <laughs> what they did in this paper that's also cool is they knocked down uh, some of the components of this uh, RNAi pathway in the mosquito, and they show that the virus levels go up when you do that. By the way, this is not true for other vector-borne parasites like malaria and oh, higher than this. There's even a worm infection that's transmitted by black flies, and uh, the heavier the infection, the more toll it takes on the host, no matter what they are, either mm -hmm. warm-blooded or cold-blooded. So one of the control measures in nature for keeping, uh, this was river blindness, for keeping it out of human populations, was to keep heavily infected cattle around, because there's a look-alike uh, infection in cattle, which humans don't get, but which black flies do get, and the heavier the infection, the more likely it is that the black fly will not transmit their own in our infection to us. And so for many, many years, they wondered why this certain group of people that herded cattle didn't get river blindness. And it was because they had these protective herds around them that were mm -hmm. killing off the black flies. Well, what do you do with all the blind cows? <laughs> well, they're all led to market, believe me. <laughs> you eat them. You eat them. Yeah. That's right. Jack took that one to market and got a handful of beans. <laughs> So when malaria goes into the mosquito, why doesn't it kill the mosquito? Sometimes does. I mean, they have huge infections sometimes, but, but mostly they don't acquire that much from the host to begin with. The host would be almost dead at this point then. Does the malaria parasite multiply in the mosquito? It does. It does. It does. So maybe there is a similar kind of anti-malarial response that tempers it in mosquitoes. There are, in fact, there are refractory strains of mosquitoes, and one of the thoughts was to be to be able to breed this into wild strains of mosquitoes mm -hmm. to prevent them from acquiring the infection. The thing about malaria that really drives me crazy is the fact that mosquitoes can survive on a single blood meal. And if they do, they can't transmit malaria because you need to bite twice. Mm -hmm. For these viral infections that are vertically transmitted, you only have to bite once. So, you know, why, why has evolution selected for a mosquito species that bites twice when they can achieve their reproductive imperative by simply mm -hmm. uh, biting a person once and then laying eggs? So, I can't think of a reason. And only 1% of the mosquitoes that do transmit uh, malaria, only 1% of those mosquitoes actually bite twice. Well, if they 
if they bite once um, and get their and get to eat their fill, then they can serve, they can um, go ahead and reproduce. But if they bite once and start to uh, no, right. start to get a meal, and then somebody brushes them off, uh, but that that you know that doesn't work out either, Alan, because it takes about a week for the malaria parasites to develop inside the mosquito. So if they bit three people in a row and still got their fill, that would be enough. Okay. Okay, there was a little diversion in this, this that, week in parasitology. <laughs> I, I can only yes. talk about what I know. It's okay. <laughs> you know, that's, Look, professors okay. are famous for this. <laughs> General principles in infectious diseases. Correct. We don't have to focus on no, viruses, be, right. especially right. if we learn from other systems, right? You betcha. One more thing I want to notice a note about this uh, mosquito virus interaction. Many other groups have shown before that in Drosophila there are RNAi pathways that limit infection with Drosophila viruses. Wow. Okay, so this is not a new thing, and I'm sure if there are any insect virologists listening, they're cringing because they're not getting the publicity. <laughs> this is dengue, right? Yeah, well. So it's already been shown to exist in Drosophila. And we should also note that a few months ago, another group did almost the same work with Synbis virus, another mosquito-borne virus. All right, before we get on to Max, here is a word from the American Society for Microbiology. May 17th through the 21st at the Pennsylvania Convention Center in Philadelphia, the American Society for Microbiology will hold its 109th general meeting, the largest annual gathering of microbiologists in the world. Visit the general meeting website at gm.asm.org to view the preliminary program, register for the meeting, or reserve your hotel stay. That's gm.asm.org. Max Gottesman. Welcome to TWIV. Well, thank you for inviting me. Oh, Max, I've uh, been thinking about having you for <laughs> years. Well, we've only been doing TWIV since It's September. episode two. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> How long ago did you start working on phages? From the very beginning? Did you do a PhD in phages, or was it afterwards? It was afterwards. Um, it, let me think. It's about 1968, I think, I started working on phage as, as at the National post- Institutes of Health. As a postdoc. As a postdoc. Whose lab? Someone called Michael Yarmolinsky. Mm-hmm. a very famous phage person, the brother of Adam Yarmolinsky of notoriety, one of the best and the brightest in the Vietnam War. Wonderful. <laughs> Already we have a wonderful story. <laughs> so you started as a postdoc at NIH, and then you stayed on at NIH for many years, right? Yeah, I stayed on until 85. You had uh, your own lab, right? Yes. And you came here in 1985. I did, right, and I brought viruses with me. <laughs> As we all do. <laughs> well, you know, Bill Gates released mosquitoes. We release viruses. This is true. This is all true. <laughs> so, Max, do you love phages? They're my favorite thing. The, you know, they're very abundant. I think that's the most of the most most uh, things uh, biologically mm-hmm. active things in the world are are phages, and uh, you know, people don't realize that they live everywhere, uh, and they are remarkable creatures and easy to work with, very friendly. User friendly. <laughs> Do every species of bacteria have their own phage? I think anything that every time you've looked for one, you see them. You do. That's a, as far as I know, yeah. And they're related too. I mean, to one another. To one another, yeah. You can classify them. So tell us something good about phages, Max. <laughs> I don't understand you're a historian of phages, right? Well, I actually have brought a little publication with me which I'll leave here for you. And uh, if anybody wants to read it on the over the the air, they can. It's accessible. The, one of the phages that I, my favorite is called bacteriophage lambda, and I've written a history of this called Little Lambda, Who Made Thee? Who discovered lambda? It wasn't the first phage discovered, right? It was not the first phage discovered, but it was the first, um, it was the first temperate, no, it wasn't the first temperate phage, but it was one of the very first temperate phages, and I'll tell you what that means in a bit. And it was discovered by uh, Esther Letterberg at the University of Wisconsin. Joshua's wife. Joshua's wife. Joshua Letterberg, a famous bacterial geneticist, right? Indeed. right? Nobel laureate. Right. He showed that bacteria have sex. The first phage discovered ever was a, a lytic phage, the 1913-14 twort, Darrell. That's right. Those were lytic phages. Those phages uh, have, are still of interest, scientific interest, because they are lytic. That means they kill the bacteria they infect, and they're being explored as uh, therapeutic agents. Is that right? Yeah. Where uh, uh, antibacterials and fail, drugs fail, people are looking at bacteriophage as a way of killing off drug-resistant bacteria. And there are several companies that are busy at work. Hmm. Are they using the phages or or the lysins, the proteins produced the by phages. them? The phages. Really? Oh. 
You inject people with phages. You swallow them. You swallow them. Is that right? Now, this is actually a very old idea, isn't it? It's very old, yes. The, um, in fact, the, uh, during the Second World War, Japanese medics carried a phage kit with them. No kidding. Ah, you're serious. It's true. What were they trying to prevent? Diarrhea. Ah. Salmonella, Shigella, etc.? Yeah. Did it work? That's not clear. I, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I thought I'd ask. It's <laughs> not clear. The usual the famous scientific uh, explanation. I that from malaria. I know what happened, actually. <laughs> but it must have been promising. Otherwise, these companies wouldn't be raising capital, right? Sure. And, uh, so even today, this is being done. Absolutely. I, I thought it had failed For, for years gastrointestinal ago. disorders is yes, what you're right. saying. Okay. But what about for fulminating infections of tuberculosis and things like that? Any hope there? You'd have to get it into the lung. So I don't think you can do that. For skin infections, it's a possibility, though. Or how about injecting? Uh, I wouldn't want to do that. No. They're very antigenic, They're right? They're very antigenic. Okay. So they okay. get cleared rapidly. Sure. But that's interesting. For, and so right now, as we sit here, somewhere in the U.S., a company is working on this. In fact, in uh, Georgia, in the former USSR. Mm -hmm. I think a few years ago, there was a Sunday Times Magazine article on the former Soviet effort to do this. I know there's a fellow at Rockefeller, Vincent Fischetti, who uses the, the license produced by phages. Mm -hmm. He's expressed those and wants to use them too as antibacterials. Max, why are you still interested in this? This is 1968 research. You're now in the year 2009. What keeps your interest? Well, there's still a lot of stuff we don't understand. And uh, as the as the ways of investigating the behavior of uh, viruses it gets more and more uh, uh, user-friendly, we can find out things that we never even suspected before and about... Such as? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I just... <laughs> I'll be the foil in this one. You can be. <laughs> well, let me first um, tell you what a temperate phage is, mm -hmm. because then you can... And then I'll tell you the next story. So there are lytic phages and temperate phages. Lytic phages... Um, kill their host, which are bacteria. So every time a bacterium gets infected by a lytic phage, the bacterium dies. A temperate phage sometimes kills the bacterium, but sometimes doesn't kill it. And it just, it's, the bacterium survives and the phage goes into the DNA of the bacterium. It established residency in the, in the DNA, like the HIV virus will do in, in human cells. It stays uh, integrated, inserted into the uh, chromosome of the bacterium and remains there indefinitely. Um, until some signal comes, for example, ultraviolet light, tells the phage it's time to get out, and it does, and then it, then it kills. So this, um, this choice of lifestyles, lytic where it kills and temperate where it doesn't kill but goes in and survives inside the bacterium, that's something called the genetic switch, which is mm -hmm. of some interest, and people still do not understand why that should be, why some survive and some don't. So Max, in the soil where the bacteria live... Do we know whether this switch occurs, or are they always lysogenic, integrated in their natural habitat? So I don't know the answer to that, but you can find um, you can find a lot of uh, bacteriophage in calf serum. In fact, mm. hmm. that's the, the 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 calves have been eating grass, and there's a little soil contamination, and it's it's coming through into their serum, so it's passing through their gut out into their. So these are lysogenic phages. Some are lysogenic. Yeah, so that would imply that it's, it's there. And there are some yeah. lysogenic phages in there. They become the tools of molecular biology, don't they? Yeah, so, the, so these bacteriophage are, as I say, very user-friendly. They grow in 40 minutes, you know, so you don't have to wait around a long time for them <laughs> to develop. They're very easy They're to uh, make mutants, so you can test various functions by knocking out functions or adding functions. And yet they have this complicated lifestyle, the temperate lifestyle of getting into the bacterium. And so the study of this has led to all sorts of uh, advances. So they say it's not so different from HIV infection, not so different from control mechanisms that allow thyroid cells to be thyroid cells or skin cells to be skin cells. It involves uh, viral proteins binding to viral DNA and preventing the expression of genes. And all of these things, in fact, were first worked out in these bacterial viruses many, many years ago before sequencing, before all these sophisticated approaches, just by looking for viruses that grew or didn't grow. Before sequencing, there was genetics, right? Before sequencing, there was genetics, right? <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. So before we knew anything about retroviral integration, we knew about phage DNA integration. Yes, we knew that it integrated. We knew where it integrated. And we had a, um, a, a phage-specific enzyme that promoted this integration. And that is ex extremely similar to HIV 
Integrase? Uh, integrase, yeah. Is, so the mechanism is similar? Very integration. similar. Wow. That's amazing. Uh, so it's fair to say that a lot happened first with phages before it occurred with any other kind of virus. Right. So I think that, um, you know, the later, working uh, later in the field of virology, they had this basis in phage research that certainly accelerated their research and told mm -hmm. them where they might be looking. I don't know if that's universally appreciated at all by... By the NIH. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, certainly not by the NIH. If anyone should know, you should, Max, because you spent more time there than we did. <laughs> well, weren't lambda phages first used for recombinant DNA, aside from plasmids? I don't know what came first, the plasmid recombinants or the lambda recombinants? I think that lambda came first. And, um, yeah, so uh, there were uh, libraries of uh, lambda phage that carried pieces of foreign DNA. Mm-hmm. And the reason that you could do this with lambda, because, again, because lambda has two life cycles, and it carries genes that are required for the temperate cycle, the integrase, and genes that shut off the viral functions when the virus is integrated, and other genes that are required for the lytic, that is heads, tails, and so on. And so you can take out the phage genes that are required for the temperate cycle and replace them with, say, animal, mm -hmm. higher right. animal genes. Right, right. And the, the virus doesn't care. It can't go through the temperate cycle, but it can replicate lytically. You can't do this with uh, lots of other organisms because they need all the genes they've got. So I don't understand why a temperate life cycle is good. Do we, do we understand that? Is it simply to propagate the phage? Why can't we do that lytically as many animal viruses do, for example? Well, interestingly enough, a lambda is not like influenza and it dries out. So if you have the free phage, the free virus, uh, it doesn't last very long. Mm. dries out and dies. But if it's living inside a bacterium, it can persist. The bacterium is much more resistant to the environment, and it stays there. And uh, when it's time to come out, it can come out. Does it survive spore formation, for instance, and be subtle and things like this? So I don't actually I don't know the answer to that. But sorry, I imagine I'm sorry it was, I asked the question. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> no it, should, it, should be, it should be in there. <laughs> so maybe the lytic cycle is an accident. It's not really <laughs> part of... It's the phage's life. The integration should be sufficient to keep it propagated. Well, right? You know, it sounds like a concentration problem, Vince. When mm. you've got a lot of bacteria around, then you can afford to lice. But if yeah. you've got a few, you mm -hmm. have to build the numbers back up. Maybe you shouldn't yes. lice. And that's precisely what happens. So when there are a lot of bacteria and very few viruses, every infection goes lytic. The virus is happy. It's got lots of food. It kills right. the bacterium and so on. When there are lots of viruses and very few bacteria, it's always temperate. There you go. It's time to you figure that out. Well, you, intuitive. You gave us the answer before the, we had it that you're a good teacher. So the <laughs> other question I have then is, is there a signal from the bacteria that the virus responds to that almost like bacteria respond to how many of them there are? I just heard a great talk on that, by the way, of these um, uh, quorum molecules that the bacteria right. throws out into the environment. Are there molecules like that that viruses respond to also? There are. The um, bacteria that are growing... Um, um, very well. They have lots of sugar to grow on. They have very low levels of a chemical called cyclic AMP. And whereas bacteria that have run out of good food and so on have high cyclic AMP levels. And high cyclic AMP levels tend to direct the infecting phage to the temperate pathway, as you might expect. But we're always discovering new things. And maybe I'll, I'll tell you this because it's a very fascinating observation. So if you have one virus infecting one bacterium, it's lytic. It kills the bacterium. If you have two it's temperate. And someone actually looked to see where the first virus attaches to the bacterium. And it's at the pole. And the second one goes in the middle. And it's thought that the local environment is different at the pole of the bacterium than in the middle of the bacterium. Oh, wow. Hmm. Can I ask you a disease question now to, to go forward? I know you want to come back to the molecular biology of this. We've got a lot of time here. Uh, you know, cholera is a, an infection that's a bacterial infection, but it has another unit of DNA in it, which encodes for the cholera toxin, which is not part of the integrated uh, cholera genome. And it was just recently discovered, say recently, 10 years ago. But uh, So that's, is that a lytic phage or is that a temperate phage? I think it's a temperate phage. And I think um, th that's not the only example. Um, e uh, pathogenic E. coli have a, okay. a temperate phage, and they produce the toxin. And diphtheria? Diphtheria is also a, f a temperate phage. Scarlet correct? fever and strep throat. Are there any lytic phases, phages that are involved in disease process caused by bacteria? Or is it the opposite? They're going to prevent the bacteria from developing. Well, I think they would prevent the bacteria from developing. Right. So is there a way to get the temperate 
phage to behave lytically. <laughs> well, and you knock out cholera before it even gets knock started. Out cholera. Well, as I say, the, these phages sense the health of the bacterium, right. and um, in particular, whether or not there's any DNA damage. Mm -hmm. These phages are very sensitive for when the bacterium, the chromosome of the bacterium starts to fragment, and the phage knows it's time to come out. So in principle, yes. The phage bacterium, it's a symbiotic relationship because the, um, the toxin poisons the gut, and you get diarrhea, which dis disperses the sure. bacterium, right? Absolutely. And the phage as well. So it works out best for everybody except the carrier. Right. So why don't the phages just wipe out all the bacteria of the world? Why don't we just throw phages everywhere and wipe out the bacteria, and that's the end of it? Well, then there wouldn't be any more phage because they would dry up, and exactly. you know, for the most right. part, they would disappear. So there's an advantage to that. The other, the question that we don't fully understand is that it is can be an advantage for the bacterium to carry the the phage. So I mentioned one instance where the phage gives you diarrhea, and so the bacterium then has a chance of spreading. But there are other more subtle advantages, and um, we keep on finding out new things. So that, for example, we thought we understood lambda, for example, which is a we have all the genes and know what they encode and so on. But somebody decided to look and compare a bacterium that carries a lambda inserted in the chromosome and one that doesn't, just looking at all the genes mm. that were expressed. And there, were, there was a profound change in bacterial physiology as a result of this inserted bacterial virus mm. lambda. Wow. Big changes in intermediary metabolism. So what this means for the bacteria, we still don't know, mm. but it is a profound change, and it must mean something or it wouldn't be there. Absolutely. Mm. Do we think that phages arose from bacterial genomes years ago, became autonomous? Well, I wasn't around then, but... Um... <laughs> really? <laughs> this is pre-League of Nations. <laughs> but it must be that. I mean, the, mm -hmm. if you have an obligatory parasite, right, like a phage, uh, it can't develop before the host. So it must develop after the host, right? Exactly. From, sort of from first principles. Yep. Mm -hmm. Like uh, animal viruses. Right. Same or any other yeah. parasitic relationship. But you could have reverse evolution, right? You could have a, a free-living organism that loses genes and becomes a parasite. Yep. You can imagine that. And, um, well, mitochondria, for example, were uh -huh. bacteria, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, so we yeah. think. Yeah. And chloroplasts. They found, and chloroplasts they, they found a nice place to live, and right. it's easier than being on your own. I had a, a more basic question to come back to the why don't all the bacteria die when you spread a plate full of phage over it? Are there resistant forms of the same bacteria that would arise in a plate of bacteria that grew to confluence, let's say, on a, a sabros glucose or or something like this, and you spread out that lambda virus and it went into every cell, but this one over here didn't respond? Well, that's absolutely right, and that's the, that's the major problem with phage therapy, because you get res resistant bacteria fairly quickly. So the, these resistant bacteria lack the receptor uh -huh. to which the uh, bacterial uh, virus can attach. Okay, so without that receptor, the bacterium just doesn't see the phage. So what these companies are doing, or what people are thinking of doing, is making a cocktail of different bacterial viruses, <laughs> each one with a different receptor. So it's impossible for the bacterium, at least in one genetic step by one mutation, to become resistant to the entire cocktail. Right. That's the logic. Is there any other way that a bacteria could become resistant to the phage once it gets inside? like cut its DNA or with a restriction enzyme or something? Mm -hmm. That's absolutely correct, and there was a... <laughs> hey, Alan, are you listening? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> this is called seat of the pants virology. <laughs> Harkening you know, back to my early days. <laughs> do you know who discovered that? Do you know who... Dis you, you would know who discovered oh, Max. Vern Ver Arbor? Is that... No, no, even earlier. Earlier. Really? Restriction and modification of DNA using phages. Salvador... Luria. 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 1952. Yeah. I have a little history chart here. Oh, yeah. uh, okay. Yes. Bacteriophage landmarks okay. in molecular biology. So, do the restriction enzymes <laughs> of a given strain of bacteria, an inbred strain of what you would call pure, there are mutations even at that level which would result in a, a failed lambda infection? Is that true? Yeah, so there are a lot of um, there are bacteria that have these restriction enzymes that recognize foreign DNA. It's coming in from the bacterial virus and, and chew it up, degrade it, prevent the, the infection. Essentially the bacterial immune system. It's like the bacterial immune system, but the, the phages, of course, are smarter than that, and they have almost every phage has a function which suppresses 
These restriction <laughs> enzymes. Of course they do. Spy versus spy. I used to love that series <laughs> in Mad Magazine, but that that's whoever drew that series knew what they were talking about. They were probably a former parasitologist <laughs> that didn't get funded. <laughs> How can you not believe in evolution when you hear these things? Exactly. Exactly. Well, I can see how you could not. <laughs> we won't get into that. <laughs> you could, but it would be wrong. Um, so the, the lambdoids are all this switch. They switch between temperate and lytic lifestyles. But there are some phages that are just lytic, right? That's right. The T phages, for That's example. That's right. They're just lytic. Are there phages that are just lysogenic? There are phages that are um, that are just lysogenic and are defective. I mean, mm -hmm. so a bacteria, for example, like E. coli, have six or so what's called cryptic phages. These are phages that have uh, almost all the genes, but not, not every single one, and they are sitting in the chromosome, just like our chromosome is pepper peppered with remnants of viruses, Indeed. so are bacteria. Indeed. And um, what these guys are doing there and why evolution hasn't <laughs> shocked them is not, mm -hmm. not clear, but presumably they must confer some advantage, yeah. just like our yeah. remnant viruses sure, do sure. too. Or, or just no obvious disadvantage. So, Max, what, what question are you addressing right now in your research? What is the uh, lab working on? So, um, we're, what we're working on is um, actually a warfare between one phage and another. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, in which um, one temperate phage prevents the replication of the propagation of a second one. And it does this by making a very specific protein, which binds to the RNA of the second phage and prevents... Um, gene expression. Wow. I'm trying to figure out exactly how this, how this works. How many, let's say, take typical E. coli out of my stool and grow it to confluence. How many different receptor molecules for different phages are there on a single bacterium? Well, for any one phage, there are thousands. Thousands? Yeah. Because they use, the phage use, um, these receptors are not there just for the phage. So the phage is preempting or taking over some other pathway. Sure. So lambda, for example, uses a pathway that the bacterium use, uses to bring in maltose. To transport proteins. Right. Transport yeah, sugars. Sure, and sure. Other phages have other receptors, but again, these receptors are abundant, obviously. Other f that's what the phage wants, a lot of receptors. Sure. Because they're used for something that, that the bacterium needs, like maltose, which is sure. a very common um, food for bacteria. So your work to get back to Max's work. It's okay. No, no, we jump all around. It's okay. Sort of like jumping genetic elements. You're studying gene regulation. So you're going to understand it at a molecular level how this works one day, right? That's the hope. And what will, what will humanity gain from this? It's a tough question. I'm sorry, but someone has to ask. It <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough question, but what we all... The assumption we're all working on, which is pretty valid, is that what you find even in these very simple organisms is true for the most complicated, such as man or cabbage or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I mean, and that tends to be true. I mean, we add on more levels of complexity, but we have a basis in regulation which you can see right away with these bacterial mm -hmm. viruses. I, I'm conver convinced. You don't have to convince <laughs> me that we should always work on all all of these things because you never know what you're going to find. That's right. And I mean, it, the, the story with phages is, is the best example. Every time something has been done, you find out something fundamental. So we haven't learned any, everything yet, right? So we should still continue to work on well, them. I, I couldn't agree more. Something has always been bugging me. In, and in fact, you asked this weeks ago. There are, as you said before, there are a lot of phages in the ocean, a million per milliliter, uh -huh. I think. Where are they coming from? Are there bacteria in the ocean? Yeah, there are, and uh, um, and I think they're growing on these on these bacteria. Maybe there are other things they can grow on as well. Algae, probably algae. Algae, yeah. blue green algae, for yeah, example. Coccolithic phytoplankton. But there not there aren't bacteria as we know them. E. coli, Salmonella, Streptococci. These do these exist in the ocean? Well, right in the Hudson River. Anyway. Cholera is a good example. Well, where there, where there are people, yeah, yes. But things. if you go way out into the yeah. middle of the Atlantic. Cholera, cholera is quite prevalent in the ocean. Cholera and they have phages of Vibrio. Vibrio is a, a big an ocean dweller. Right? That's right. Yeah. And there are, of course, phages of, sure. of cholera. You know, they found out by doing um, the following analysis. They took a, a, a volume of seawater and measured the protein content. And then they mm -hmm. filtered the bacteria out yes. and measured the protein content of the bacteria. And it was like one-tenth of the total protein. They said, what the hell is the rest of this stuff? 
It could be dissolved proteins. It could, it could have been, but it turned out not to be. As soon as they did the electron microscopy of the supernate, they found out it was all virus. So there's a lot of lateral transmission of genomes going on here, right? There is. Lots of it. If you sequence these, uh, these different viruses, and there are many, many uh, tempered viruses, for example, uh, Lambda and 434 and 21 and 80 and so on. There are lots and lots of them. And you uh, sequence their chromosome. They are um, they're quilt works. They're chimeras, bits mm. and pieces. So this, this is all lateral uh, mm -hmm. distribution. Sure. By co-infecting a host, multiple phages. Right. Exchange, exchange DNA, right. I, I understand that when the, when the ocean is sequenced or when it was sequenced, a lot of these phages, brand new genes that had never been known before, were discovered new Craig proteins. Craig and his group. Entirely. Yep. Are, are you familiar with that? There are a lot of uh, uh, genes that are so-called non-annotated, which means we have no idea what they do. They don't fit anything in the database. They're a very healthy percentage of what turns up in these viruses. But then in addition, you see your standard cassettes, a cassette that allows the DNA to replicate, a cassette which obviously encodes tails and, uh, and things like that. But Lots of, uh, lots of genes just don't make any sense yet. Hmm. Hmm. Do they translate the proteins and take a look at that also to see that they still don't make sense even at that level? I mean, you can actually do three-dimensional structure analysis on their proteins and find out what they might be like, at least. Yeah, the folding algorithms are still an emerging... Um, <laughs> yeah, but you can express the protein. I mean, you can actually make that work in a bacterium, right? In theory. Oh, right. But and then collect a, the protein and take a look. It's a lot of money to do that. Yeah. You might have the cure for cancer. Yeah, but if there. you're not sure, <laughs> you're never going to get funded to do that unless you it. have function. Well, there is there is a uh, proteomic structure initiative um, that's trying to do this. They're trying to crystallize and solve the structures of as many proteins as they can. As they can, um, it's as you might imagine, it's been slow going. Could a lot of these encode the capsids for these protein for these viruses? It could, but I have a feeling that would show up in some similarity to other capsids, but um, I don't know. There aren't that many different ways to make capsids. In fact, one of the things I was going to mention just a few weeks ago, Jack Johnson <laughs> at Scripps <laughs> solved the structure, the x-ray structure of the uh, procapsid of lambda, HK97, which is a lambdoid phage. It right? is, right. Procapsid is an intermediate in assembly. Apparently, the capsid of lambda is so complicated, you need to have an intermediate to allow proteins to get into the right places before you have the mature capsid. So they solved this. It was the first uh, stru such structure. This came out of nature, and the last paragraph is, these viruses, the capsids have the same protein fold as herpes virus capsids. Probably uh -huh. darn. Wow. So there aren't that many ways to make capsids okay. that we know of, but we could discover new ones. So who knows? I have I a mean, feeling they, these are mostly enzymes yeah. and proteins of that sort. But I think those are the most interesting to find out what they're doing, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, there are big problems in packaging the, the uh, chromosomes of, these, uh, of the viruses in the capsid. Remember, there's a it's a long piece of DNA in a small hole, and it's got to go. How does it get in there? How does it get packed in? Needle and thread. <laughs> I mean, these heads are full of DNA, right? That's right. These really, it must be a pack. micro motor. There's huh. a little micro motor Is in it? there that reels them in. <laughs> well, it's, yeah, it takes energy. So um, somebody proposed that it was like a a reel on a fishing rod, and that you wrapped it up that way. But I don't. There's not really good evidence for Maybe that. Maybe nanobiologists will come up with the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I read uh, not too long ago that. It's packed under such high hydro hydrostatic pressure, it requires enormous force to get it into the head. Wow. Because then it shoots out when it reaches the right bacterium. Uh -huh. Right. And right. So it squirts that right out. Squirts right out. But to get it in is extremely difficult. And pack yeah, it somebody, in. somebody calculated 50 atmospheres of pressure during genome packaging. Wow. Really? It's a lot. It seems to have no problem at doing this, though. So no. there's got to be a simple explanation. It's had a long time to work it out. At the molecular level. It's had a long time. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that people understand now is that the capsid for these things, um, there are many, many subunits, but they become covalently locked. So it's like a suit of armor. Chainmail. Uh -huh. right. Chainmail. Right. Mm -hmm. So I understand now your fascination with this. I honestly do. I mean, it doesn't really matter at what level you study parasitism. It has, it has its fascination. It is a universal behavior, and uh, you're conveying to us a very, very passionate and long-term association with that, uh, with that vision. Well, it is. I mean, there's a deep logic, or we wouldn't have these That's creatures, right. exactly. and they've been evolving for billions of years. And Got it. So, as I like to say, the, uh, Lambda has 47,000 bases, and each one is there for some reason. They're conserved. 
So lambda from Africa is the same sequence. Uh, Remarkable. So yes. there's, there's a reason why they're there. Mm -hmm. So the Hong Kong 97 capsid is uh, this viral chain mail. It's interlinked subunits that yeah. lock together. I have a nice picture here. The other one, the other photo I came across is this a structure. This is your new book, Vince? This is my new textbook. I, I need to get a copy of that, by the way. Otherwise, I'm going to remain in the dark. Would you like it autographed? I would, I would love it autographed. Okay, I'll give you I a would, copy. In fact, I demand that I you I think all TWIV guests should have a copy. <laughs> That's the reward for showing up. That's uh -huh. exactly right. I don't have a problem with that. It'd be fine. The... Um, Bacteriophage PRD1. Anyway, the uh, capsid of PRD1 looks just like the adenovirus uh, hexon monomer. Bacterial virus and an animal virus, the same capsid fold. So this is an example of the notion that there are only so many ways to build a viral capsid. Or it was conserved from the plants to the animals on the way up the evolutionary tree. Could be that too, but I like the other explanation <laughs> better. Uh, so this structure, the procapsid just came out a few weeks ago, so people are still working. Are lambdoid phages the most worked on? Yeah, I think so. They, um, the study of lambda and, and these other temperate phages has gone on for decades and decades. And so lambda has had a, um, has always attracted um, a lot of scientists, maybe less now than, than in the past, but it's always been a very lively group. And it's been a, been a wonderful group to be involved with because it was, from the very first, it was very uh, collaborative, cooperative, exchange of uh, ideas and strains and virus, mutants, and so on. So I think that was um, one of the attractions of working in, the, in that from the very beginning. It was just a pleasure to be with these people. And of course, this is no longer the case in science. We're no longer collaborative or interactive. We're less so because we're more competitive, because money has gotten tighter. I think that's right. Well, when I went to graduate school, we learned an awful lot about phages and bacteria. It was what molecular biology was mostly about. It's what we knew. Now it's quite different, unfortunately. But I do think that learning about phages uh, is important. We actually included a lot more in the third edition of the textbook because people said, how can you call a book Principles of Virology without having <laughs> bacteriophages? So. Well, if you think about what we just discussed with Max here, I mean, we've talked about We've talked about uh, virus entry and immunity and um, uh, host range restriction and um, integration of a virus. I mean, this is these are all of the uh, all the common themes of virology, and they all show up in in lab. So, Alan, uh, do you do you ever get big stories about phages? They they come up rarely. They're um, I mean, a, a lot of it, unfortunately, is this behind the scenes work that that like Max is talking about, where, you know, you work you work on phage and then a number of years later somebody finds something similar in herpes virus and that's going to be big news. Then you also see stuff like the uh, the cholera toxin. You know, here's a, an enormous public health problem that is ultimately traceable, at least in part, to a bacteriophage. And it turns out that the, the phage is a, an integral part of, of the disease cycle. So you do see you do see stories like that. Unfortunately, what happens in that case is usually, at least in the um, in larger news outlets, the, the kind of the details of the story tend to get lost. I was going to say in this pro-capsid story, which the press picked up, you couldn't tell it was a phage structure until the last sentence, right. where they said, you know, this is a fa this is a bacterial virus, and it may apply to human herpes viruses also. So they always have to get that in because people, I think, people don't understand why we should be studying these, and maybe uh, we need to do more publicity, more outreach, more podcasts. Principles, <laughs> principles of parasitism. There's a wonderful opportunity here for taking a, a typical example of a host and a parasite and going from the very simplest there. And you've already told us they're not simple. They start out complex. There's no such thing as a simple host-parasite relationship. No matter how far down, and I'd say down or up, the way that's portrayed, that's too bad that it is this way. But no matter how simplified you think the life forms are that you're dealing with, you're still going to have the same problems to answer. The exact same problems. Well, on that uh, poetic note... We shall move on to the remainder of our show, which comprises a, a few emails and our picks of the week. We do this every week. We get a lot of email, Max, and so I like to read some of them. This one was on iTunes. Wayne writes, a real scientist talking about a subject he loves. Vincent Racaniello is a professor at Columbia, and he knows about viruses. His enthusiasm for this topic is exciting and infectious. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> the podcast has usually one other expert, and the discussions are fascinating. Polio, West Nile, AIDS, and many more. I would like to hear a TWIV show on evolution of viruses with some speculation about how viruses got started. Which came first, the virus or the cell or something else? Thanks. I think that's a great idea for a show. 
Mary writes, Dear Twivers, what a wonderful podcast you do. Thank you. I have been enjoying it for several months now and hope you guys reach that goal of 100. Wow. You ask what listeners would like to hear about. I am really looking forward to the next Herpes episode to cover the family members that were missed the first time around, such as CMV and EBV. And I'm hoping you might be able to do an episode on marine viruses, which you mentioned some time ago as a possibility. This might provide insight into the question you pondered in an earlier episode of what is the most abundant virus species. <laughs> She's in the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> discussed in comparison to HIV being the most numerous in humans. Maybe a marine virus episode could also include discussions of Acanthamoeba polyphaga mimivirus and its interesting sidekick, the Sputnik virophage. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. How could we have left that out already? I don't know. Gosh. <laughs> we'll get to that. <laughs> Mimi viruses are hard to miss. No, I can't believe yeah, those, those are some of my favorite <laughs> organisms. I want to thank you on behalf of virology grad students everywhere for all your efforts, insights, and wit shared mm. with us via Twitter. Of course, viruses are fascinating all by themselves, but you guys make them entertaining too. All right. Thank you, Mary. Mm -hmm. That's very kind. I'm going to try to get my head out the door. Now. I'm going to say, you know, I thank God I don't wear hats. <laughs> <laughs> I am a new listener having just begun to explore podcasts with a graduate degree in business, but virtually no science. I am constantly seeking ways to play catch up. It's not that my day job requires it. I'm in the commercial real estate business in Chicago. It's just that I'm I, sorry. I find the sciences fascinating and my gap in knowledge embarrassing. For better and worse, I've adopted biotech investing as a hobby. And I'm somehow, really sorry. <laughs> vaccines is a focus. I've been an investor in one publicly traded Canadian biotech called Oncolytics Biotech for nine years, and so far it hasn't been good for my financial health, but it remains the most compelling science story in my portfolio. Hmm. Might make a great topic for your podcast. So he talks about viruses being used as oncolytic agents. Yeah. Yes. He wants us to do a show about that. I think that would yep. be a good idea. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And finally, Irene writes, Great Program 20, that was last week. Thanks for taking the time about the movie I produced with the fantastic skills from Ex Vivo, Digizyme, and data from Yorgo Modis. It was the movie, the Dengue Entry movie you were talking yeah, about. Yeah, it was fabulous. I can Just give you fabulous. a copy of the movie to post on your blog. Oh, wonderful. NIAAD gave me some money to do that a year ago, and the version, one version was a winner of a Golden Cine Award this year. It was made for science teachers and K-12 students. David Belinsky, as I recall. The that. proper list of, of uh, contributors is posted at the end of the movie. And again, many thanks for noticing the movie. I would like to produce the sequel. Mm. Where do we get the funding to do yeah. that? Tell me about it. Any ideas are welcome. Great to hear Matt Evans talk about his recent findings. Okay, our picks of the week. Science blog is Biojoblog by my friend Cliff Mintz, who I went to college with. He's a former medical school professor, industrial scientist, professional recruiter, management consultant, entrepreneur, and career development expert who has been around the block and wants to share his experience to help others launch successful careers in the bioscience industry. Very good blog. It's about basically getting jobs in in biosciences uh, it's very illuminating and I recommend it for those of you uh, thinking about working in this field our science podcast of the week is called distillations a weekly science podcast that brings you extracts from the past present and future of chemistry a little bit of history of chemistry very interesting new episode every Friday with interviews monologues reviews features and more to gain historical perspective on current scientific issues and finally our science book of the week it's called the life of a virus by angela krieger you know this book mac no i don't it's a it's basically a history of, of tobacco mosaic <laughs> virus uh -huh. an introduction to a plant virus that has taught us much of what we know about all viruses including the lethal ones and that also played a crucial role in the development of molecular biology she starts from the discovery crystallization all the things that we've learned from tobacco mosaic virus it's quite good she's a historian at princeton mm -hmm. so it has an academic bent i worked on that virus once tobacco mosaic virus mm -hmm. yeah so what do you like better phages or tmv <laughs> <laughs> phages uh, much i didn't like smearing leaves with uh, a <laughs> that's right that's how you do the infections okay <laughs> twiv will be live at asm asm meeting philadelphia may 17th to 19th we're going to do a live TWIV in front of a live audience, obviously. It'll be recorded. It'll be video cast May 19th, 2 o'clock p.m. See www.asm.org for meeting details, and we'll provide some updates as we go we might along. have some surprise guests. Yeah. <laughs> so Dick and, and I and perhaps Alan will be there, and maybe a few other people will be sitting up front, and the, the audience can join in. It should be fun. 
have to go down to Pat's for a cheesesteak, too. Yep. <laughs> good old Philly cheesesteak. Lots of go. virologists in Philly, so we should yeah. be able yeah. to get some good guests. I lived I lived there for a few years. That's right, you did. Are you still okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I managed to get out uh, get out okay. And... There you go. <laughs> Max, I understand you're going to that meeting. I am, right. If you have time, will you come see live Twiv? I do. Of course. Okay, excellent. Wonderful. Well, if you want to ask us questions or send us comments or request twiv at twiv.tv. Max, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Max. Pleasure. Really appreciate it. You're a gentleman <laughs> and a scholar. <laughs> Absolutely. We hope you'll return someday. He's an art appreciator also. I do know And this. thank you, Dick, of course, <laughs> as usual. And thank you, Alan. My pleasure. You've been listening to This Week in Virology, a podcast about all things viruses. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. And remember, we are on iTunes. Just search for TWIV. You can find us and subscribe. Why don't you do that? And you can hear it every week. It'll be automatically downloaded to your iPod. And other TWIV is viral.